For most of us, home exists as a sanctuary that keeps the world outside at bay. For some, eerie sounds and visions turn their safe havens into prisons of fear. They believe that ghosts are living out a curse to inhabit their homes, forcing them to confront the haunting terror of the unexplained. Since the day they married in 1987, police officer Tom Brown and his wife Linda had dreamed of owning a home. In 1996, the Browns, with their two children, moved into a three-bedroom brick house on Twin Oaks Court in East Peoria, Illinois. Their dream had finally come true. It quickly became a nightmare on the very first night in the house. Tom and Linda were fast asleep when violent noises rose from the basement one floor below. It sounded like somebody's going through all of our stuff in the basement. I got up, I thought, can't be. So I went downstairs, and you could hear just plain as day, somebody's moving boxes around, throwing stuff around. It sounded like somebody was mad, just throwing stuff. Nothing's moving. Nothing's going anywhere. You could hear it, but you couldn't see nothing. Convinced that the stress of the move had been too much, Tom and Linda dismissed the incident until the terrifying sounds returned the following evening. This time, even louder. Doors knocked and slammed. Heavy footsteps shuffled on the linoleum kitchen floor just outside their three-year-old daughter Chelsea's room. I heard squeaks on the floor and it was just like someone was walking in the floor. I kept hearing these noises again and I was just really scared. And I went back in, I sat on the edge of her bed and I still didn't see anyone out there, but I heard the noises and I, it just, it was unbelievable. But it was like someone was watching, Chelsea and I. Tom and Linda were beginning to believe that someone was watching them. Someone they couldn't see. Then one night, Tom caught a glimpse of something he'll never forget. And the cat is in the living room, hissing and screeching and at you know, like he's in a cat fight. And all of a sudden, I saw this person dart into my son's bedroom. I got up, I ran in there as fast as I could. Nobody, nothing. I checked the closet, checked the bed, checked everything, and there was nobody anywhere. The Browns, who had always been skeptical about ghosts, began to fear that their new home was haunted. I tried to be rational about it and try to figure out what was going on, and I never could come up with anything. Frightened by the strange occurrences, Linda, who had become a believer, desperately wanted to move. I had had it. I told Tom, this was our first house, and I said, we're moving. We are moving in springtime. I said, that's it. I can't handle hearing things all the time and scaring me half to death. Tom, still searching for an explanation, went across the street to talk to Shirley Veniak. Her son had sold the house to Tom. Well, I asked Shirley about noises or ghosts or anything, you know, and she had got this dumbfounded look on her face like, I can't believe you said that. And then she said, you hear him too. Shirley told Tom that her parents had built the house and lived there until the late 70s. Her father, Stuart Wall, known as a caring and generally happy man, suffered a stroke in 1974 that left him disabled and deeply depressed. The thought of being a burden to his family not away at his will to live. One evening, he walked to the closet of the back bedroom, where the Brown's two-year-old son now slept, pulled the belt from his pants, and hanged himself. Shirley discovered her father barely alive and cut him down. As he lay dying in her arms, she thought he was trying to say, I'm sorry. He never did. Shirley told Tom she believed the spirit of her father was trapped in their house still trying to say, I'm sorry. The story finally convinced Tom that he and his family were living with the ghost of Stuart Wall. Tom felt helpless with nowhere to turn until he read in the local papers about a man who investigated hauntings. 
Rob Conover, a former private investigator, used to dismiss those who believed in ghosts. Until one night when he set out to prove that a so-called haunted building was a fraud. I was very sure there was nothing there, and things started to happen to prove otherwise. I walked through the door, and as I did, it felt like thousands of little cold icicles blew through me. And it got quiet. And I said, they're gone. And I think it was at that point, I said, there's something to this. And when I came out the next morning, I, I had a whole different attitude. This experience made Conover a believer, forcing him to change his title from private investigator to paranormal investigator. From then on, he devoted himself entirely to ghost busting. After he spoke with Tom about the supposed ghost of Stuart Wall, Conover reluctantly agreed to investigate. There are a lot of times I have to go tell people, no, you don't have a spirit, this is what's making the noise, whether it be a um, unruly refrigerator or air circulating through the vents at a certain time, causing a sound that sounds almost human-like, like footsteps or moaning or screaming or things like that. The Ghostbuster claims, however, that he can tell when a ghost is real. He says he is sensitive to what he calls energies in houses that contain spirits. He searches for supposed cold spots, which he says signal the presence of a ghost. When I walk into an area where there's a spirit, there's a feeling that comes over me that is very hard for me to describe. The closest I can get is to say it's like a cool electrical shock without any pain from toes to head. After the initial interview with Tom and Linda, I did a walkthrough and definitely picked up feelings. This is the room where it took place, isn't it? Conover sensed the ghost in the same places where the Browns had heard the noises. He was certain that Stuart Wall had become a tormented spirit, prowling the halls of what was once his home, and now his purgatory. Conover resolved to help the ghost find his way out of the land of the living and into another level. Paranormal investigator Rob Conover arrived at the Browns' house armed with equipment to do battle with the ghost of Stuart Wall. Twenty years before, Wall had committed suicide in the back bedroom. Conover believes that his tormented spirit now prowled its halls and he was confident that he could coax this troubled spirit through the light. His term for moving ghosts from this world to the next. When we pass away, we're all confronted with the light. And for us to stay on this side and not go through the light, the reasons for that are because we're attached to a person, place, or object on this side that we feel we have to protect or be with. Conover and his assistant began to walk through the house looking for Stewart's presence. Tom Brown, the owner of the home, and Shirley Vanyak, Stewart's daughter, followed closely behind them. I felt Stewart's presence. These stockings began to go back and forth by themselves. And I said out loud, so Stewart, you have my attention now. Do I go in the house or do I go in the basement? And at that point, there was a loud bang in the basement. So we went down into the basement, and his presence was felt big time. They focused a video camera on the room, lit several candles, and turned out the lights. With a Bible in his hand, Rob called out to the spirit, asking it to show itself to Tom and Shirley. Stuart, I know you're down here. I explained to Stuart that God is a merciful God. And Stuart had been a good person all of his life. He had helped many, many, many people. And I believed that God had a place for him on the other side and was waiting for him. After more than an hour, the supposed ghost still had not responded to Conover. But the investigator was certain of the spirit's presence. I could see Stuart's ectoplasm. The ectoplasm is the energy that goes in front of a spirit that helps him move through the air. It's made up of electricity and energy. And I was able to see that. Again, he pleaded with the spirit to appear, now worried that it might totally ignore his request. And when I had about reached the end of my rope, is when the hallway in the basement filled with this beautiful blue light that was very dense. You couldn't see through it at all. I didn't see 
the light at first until Shirley nudged me and said, see, look. And then I moved my head over and saw it. And if I would never saw it, I'd never believed it had happened. To me, it was like a uh, bluish green light. It's extremely light, bright, like a welder welding. Then, in a matter of seconds, the blue light faded away. It was at that point that I took my Bible and I stood up and made contact with Stuart and helped Stuart cross over into the light. The house felt like you had 150 guests in the house and you just crammed packed. You couldn't fit another person in and all of a sudden everybody just left and shut the lights off. It was just a very empty feeling like nobody was there no more. And you was all by yourself. Conover says at that moment the ghost of Stuart Wall left the house forever. The investigator immediately turned to the camera, excited about seeing the event on tape. This is what they saw. Yeah. Guys. Oh, look at the light. The light. Tom, being a policeman, said, I want to look at your videotape, because I, I know that light's on the videotape. We put the videotape in, you heard our conversation, but there was no light on the videotape. And Shirley said, why? And I said, because we were the only ones meant to see that light. Since that night, Calm has returned to the house on Twin Oaks Court. The mysterious sounds and terrifying visions are gone. Did the ghost of Stuart Wall pace the floors of this house? Was that spirit finally ushered to another world during this ritual? Skeptics say emphatically that ghosts do not exist and that logical reasoning can explain all anomalies linked to spirits. Professor of psychology Terence Hines believes the Browns' ghost is a figment of their imagination. When you go into any new house, new to you, uh, there are going to be strange sounds and events that you, you're not familiar with. And so if you go in thinking, my God, somebody committed suicide in Johnny's room, and you hear something odd, it's very easy to think, why? Maybe that was a ghost. It was particularly easy for Linda Brown, who had grown up next door to the walls and was six years old when Stuart Wall committed suicide. As a child, she didn't know how he died. But as an adult, she learned the tragic truth. Hines thinks this must have contributed to Tom and Linda's conclusion that the strange sounds and visions were caused by a ghost. Hines says this is natural. The human mind is actually pre-programmed to enforce order under strange experiences. The human brain is set up to create perceptions, especially when we're faced with kind of random nebulous stimuli. The brain frantically tries to wire them all together to make some coherent sense out of that. Believers in ghosts like parapsychologist Lloyd Auerbach disagree that the ghost of Stuart was purely a function of Tom and Linda's perception. You can do it, even if what comes out of your type he argues that when several witnesses are reporting the same or similar experiences, as happened in the Brown House, those witnesses must be taken seriously. It's a subjective experience experienced by many people across many years, which lends very much credibility to there being actually something there and that it wasn't just imagined by people. And that's what we look at, is how many people, how many witnesses there are, what kind of corroboration we get. Witness testimony and haunting seems to be fairly consistent. Eyewitness testimony is unconvincing because you can get eyewitnesses who will swear on the proverbial stack of Bibles that they've seen things that we clearly know don't exist. For example, you can find, if you go back to the Middle Ages, you can find people who swear that they saw witches flying on broomsticks across the sky. And I have no doubt that they really think they saw that. Conover and the Browns are certain they saw a blue light. But Tom Flynn, a skeptic who has examined hauntings, says that if they did, it should have shown up on their videotape. Video cameras respond to the same spectrum of colors that the human eye does. So if you're pointing a video camera at something and you see a blue light, so should it. So I, 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 think, it's, um, I think it's very revealing that uh, these three people report that they've had this experience and yet their own videotape doesn't verify it. Flynn also says that several of Conover's claims that he feels a presence 
can move spirits through the light and is able to see ectoplasm are based on mythology commonly used by those who believe in ghosts. One of the stock tricks that spirit mediums would do at their seances starting about in the 1860s was to produce ectoplasm. We know now that 19th century mediums were using sleight of hand tricks but out of this came the tradition that this ectoplasm, this kind of semi-material stuff, existed that pertained to the ghosts. Believers say that Conover may be relying on terms from popular culture, but his ritual appeared to be effective. Since Conover's visit, the Browns are no longer plagued by mysterious noises and phantom footsteps. The Ghostbuster that came into Tom and Linda's house may have had some genuine ability to affect the environment. This one Ghostbuster did something. What he did worked. Professor Fanuc encounters that the best way to eliminate imaginary ghosts is by using imaginary ghostbusting. This is psychological relief more than anything else. In other words, he said the things these people wished to have said. He did the things which seemed to be appropriate to what they wanted to see and hear. Was the apparition of Stuart Wall's ghost a shared vision or a shared illusion? Does the mind make the senses lie? Or do troubled spirits of the dead roam this earth? The answer depends on your belief in the supernatural. For some who say ghosts haunt their lives, relief comes when the spirit leaves or the victims depart. For others, no house can be a home. For these families, there is no respite and no escape. A painful divorce in 1968 left Beth alone with a small child and little money. She was rebuilding her life when she met Bob Batesel a few years later. They fell in love, got married, and Bob adopted Beth's daughter, Leah. In 1971, when the Batesels moved into this two-family house in New Brunswick, New Jersey, the young family's newfound happiness would be fleeting. Strange events began happening in the house. At first, Bob and Beth dismissed the odd activity. Lamps swinging, doors opening and closing, objects appearing in the wrong places. Then they were forced to confront the terror trapped in the walls of their new home. The pungent smell of rotting flowers wafted throughout the rooms. Temperatures supposedly rose to sweltering levels for no apparent reason. They began to witness shocking sights. Knives, forks and baby bottles darted about the house, making them fear for their lives. I felt very scared. Um, unsafe. Undermined. You didn't know what was coming next, and that's a very undermining feeling of never knowing that the ground or the rug is being pulled out from under you. So you didn't know what to expect, so you were always aware. So the stress level was very high. The ghastly events escalated. The Batesels claimed they were attacked by small objects hurled about the house by unseen forces. I had some friends over for lunch, and just out of nowhere, the bathtub stopper, a round bathtub stopper, just came flying between two of us that were seated at the table as though someone just threw it. The moving objects became even more threatening. One night, Bob and Beth were paralyzed with fear as they watched a lit cigarette drift down from the ceiling. We just didn't know what to do because we didn't know whether to reach out and grab it, if someone were actually holding it that we just didn't see, if it hit the floor, would it start a fight? We just didn't know what to do. The enormous stress from incidents like this forced Beth, who had never believed in ghosts, to confront what seemed very much like a haunting. Word of the Batesel's ghost spread, and a spiritual group interested in paranormal activities asked to conduct a seance in their home. Bob and Beth, at a loss for an alternative, agreed. 
We felt we were drowning in a sea of phenomena that we could not explain. We had never had this before, we didn't know anything about it at the time, and we needed help. The group gathered with Beth and Bob around the dining room table. They closed their eyes and joined hands. When the psychic called out to the spirits, the ghost began to speak through her. Beth secretly taped the proceedings. Can you tell us your name? It's my land. And you get out. Well, if we could investigate to see if it is your land, then we would get out. But you have to help us and tell us what your name is. My name is George Baxter. George Baxter? This land belonged to me. I bought it in the year 1872. Now you look that up, mister. We will, George. The next day, Beth went to the New Brunswick Library to research the history of the house. She discovered a George Baxter had bought the land in 1872. Beth was stunned, but Bob remained skeptical until a few weeks later when they found threats written in lipstick and marker on the walls and mirrors. Now Bob was certain that his house was haunted. The angry ghost became brazen, scribbling harrowing messages to the family. What you see here are the actual notes that Bob claims were written by the ghost. As the alleged hauntings escalated, the Batesels could no longer keep their eight-year-old daughter safe from the ghost. I knew something was going on. You'd have to be an idiot not to know something was going on when on your eighth birthday you wake up in the morning and there are red crosses all over the wall, walls and the words go dead written. In 1972, Beth gave birth to their second daughter, Lisa, the threat to both children loomed larger. According to Leah Batesel, by that time the ghost had already done irreparable damage to her childhood. It is a hell house. It's the house from hell. As far as I'm concerned, that house destroyed what prior to moving in there was a normal four-year-old girl. I hate that house. Beth grew to hate the house, too. She knew her daughters were frightened, and she felt that she had no way to protect them. When you touch my child, that's the line. And that's what happened. There were, there were a number of incidents, a couple in particular, that were very, very focused on our children, and we felt that that was it, and we had to leave. Unwilling to do battle with their ghost any longer, the Batesels packed up all their belongings and moved, certain they were leaving the violent spirit behind. Their desperate attempt to escape only took them deeper into the mystery. Bob and Beth Batesel and their two young daughters fled their home in New Brunswick, New Jersey, believing they were escaping the terror of the ghost that haunted them there. For four years, the Batesels lived in this house, where they were harassed almost daily by ghostly threats. Now they were searching for a more peaceful abode. The Batesels moved to an apartment in Clinton, New Jersey. The persistent ghost followed, and only became more hostile. The Batesels claimed that an unseen force shoved Beth, Bob, and Leah down the stairs they moved again. This time they moved further away to Flemington, New Jersey. They had barely finished unpacking when one morning, to Beth's horror, she found a butcher knife impaled in the kitchen door frame. She knew then they had not eluded the vicious spirit. Once again we moved into a new place hoping that the phenomena was over and it would have stayed far behind us and we could just pick up where we always were, trying to be a normal family. From 1971 to 1985, Bob and Beth moved 11 times, 
and their lives were anything but normal. We lost friends because we couldn't explain anything and everybody was looking for an explanation. Everybody would blame us. It's happening to you, therefore, it's your fault. With no one to turn to, they united to battle their demons. They built their last house from the ground up in Lake Ariel, Pennsylvania. Hoping the fresh start would finally eradicate the ghost, it didn't. The first weekend after moving into the Lake Ariel home, a ghost left the Batesels a most horrifying welcome. It was well past midnight when the Batesels were startled out of bed by hysterical crying. Rushing to their daughter's room, the Batesels found her terrified, screaming that her cat was hanging by its neck from the doorway with its eyes gouged out. The Batesels saw nothing. This ghost-like apparition had disappeared. Several nights later, the Batesels were again startled out of their sleep, as the glass and picture frames hung in the living room spontaneously exploded, shattering glass throughout the house. It's really difficult to describe how you feel when you're in the middle of a whirlwind. But we have stopped asking why, because we're too busy dealing and living with it. Most reports of hauntings link the ghost to a place. The Batesels believe that in their case, ghosts come to them. We have come to understand that there are hauntings which are attached to a particular place and, and remain. And then there are hauntings that seem to be the people. The people are haunted, not the place. So no matter where the people go, it doesn't matter. They will still be haunted. From everything that has been done and tested and what we've been told, I seem to have some kind of presence. I am some kind of magnet that seems to attract these spiritual things. The Batesels, physically and emotionally exhausted, say they can no longer try to escape the ghost. They remain in their Lake Ariel home, resigned to its hauntings and uneasy about what may lie ahead. Do the Batesels somehow attract hauntings and spirits wherever they live? Or do they create their own demons? For scientists like Nobel Prize winning physicist Leon Letterman, the answer is simple. I would just flat out say, you don't have haunted houses. You have either some uh, gullible people or some uh, dishonest people who are, uh, who are making this all up. Science has no room for ghosts. Psychologist Carl Schlatterbeck has found room for ghosts. He investigated the Batesel stories, came to support the family's claims, and joined Beth Batesel in co-authoring a book about her experiences. Um, I became a believer fairly quickly. Um, you could walk through the house and feel in different rooms. In one room it was, it was difficult to breathe even. Uh, and recordings made in that room were fainter than they were in the rest of the house. In other places, you could, you could feel things in the air. Schlatterbeck believes the Batesels found ghosts at each of their households because the entities were attracted to certain inviting qualities in Beth Batesel. One investigator referred to her as an undeveloped psychic, perhaps. Other people have just referred to her as a magnet, that her warmth and her caring about people actually extends into the other world, and that uh, lost souls who haven't uh, crossed on uh, find her a warm and comforting uh, presence to be around. Letterman points out that none of this is scientifically verifiable. The scientific method demands much more than impressions and feelings to validate a claim. To claim that I see this, I have to prove it. If the burden is on the owner of that site or the writer of the book. And uh, in 400 years of innumerable claims, no one has ever succeeded in convincing the scientific community. Parapsychologist Lloyd Auerbach finds proof in the Batesel's reports of objects floating and moving through the air. He says that when some people are under stress, 
Their energy can levitate objects. It's a phenomenon called psychokinesis. Psychokinesis is the ability that we have identified in parapsychology of the mind to directly affect matter or energy to move things. There's usually a living person there whose mind, subconscious mind typically, is letting off steam or reacting to stress and is using psychokinesis, mind over matter ability, to move those objects around. Laboratory study after study has tried to find evidence for psychokinesis and hasn't found it. The, again, eyewitness reports of something moving from here to there are very unreliable. Many scientists think psychology offers the best explanation for the happenings at the Batesel households. Psychologist and retired professor Robert Baker says that in over 50 years of investigating claims of hauntings, he's found ghosts in only one place. In the human mind. It is an invention of the human mind, and the, they have invented ghosts because ghosts provide a great deal of psychological satisfaction to the people who believe in them. It fills a gap, a void in their lives. Finucan suggests it may be easier for Beth to confront imaginary ghosts than face real issues. Ghosts can be used by particular members of the family for their own purposes as a method of self-defense, if you like, psychological self-defense, when things are going badly in the rest of the family's existence. Perhaps this is a way of seizing upon some degree of certainty for those people involved or those individuals involved. Perhaps this is a way that Mrs. Batesel, in her own case, chose to solve some of her dilemmas as they arose in her family. Are the more than 20 years of the Batesel's family's supposed hauntings the work of active spirits or an overactive imagination? Skeptics and scientists point to the lack of compelling evidence for the Batesel's claims. Believers note simultaneous sightings of ghostly events and knives driven into door frames. And they see the work of the unexplained. For centuries, Native American elders have passed down legends that tell of hidden places deep in the mountains of Colorado. For the spirits of the dead, these sites are sacred portals that provide passage in and out of this world to the next. For the living, these places are mysterious gateways that offer a glimpse of the unknown. Steve Lee, a truck driver from Dallas, was on a new delivery route driving through the mountains of Colorado. He found the beauty of the area so captivating that he moved his family to the middle of the Black Forest, 20 miles north of Colorado Springs. He bought a log cabin on five acres of land, and the boys quickly took to roaming the woods. The forest gave the children a sense of freedom and adventure. Steve took many pictures of his sons to send back to his friends and relatives in Dallas. From the start, he found that strange lights appeared in the photos. I noticed orange beams following around one of my, my youngest son. And my oldest son, I would notice a, uh, a greenish glow following him around. And uh, soon after that, um, uh, we started getting uh, things in the pictures like dogs and faces that shouldn't be there. At first, Steve dismissed the pictures, believing that something was wrong with his film. The mysterious lights and phantom fog continued to appear in his photos. Steve became obsessed with taking pictures, and each new roll of film brought more frightening discoveries. Some parts of the house were more active than others. When Steve took pictures of the mirror over his dresser, he was terrified by the reflections staring back at him. In my mirror, there seems to be uh, faces that will appear in there, uh, different people. It's not the same person. Uh, a face will uh, appear in the mirror and it will dissipate, and then another one will appear and it will dissipate. Steve refused to believe he had ghosts. He installed security cameras around the house, 
hoping to find evidence that the lights and fog were man-made. The cameras didn't pick up anything unusual, but Steve continued to be haunted by images he could not understand. He decided to contact Bill Gibbons, an electronic specialist and an amateur investigator of the paranormal. Gibbons arrived with his own video camera. In the evening, he placed the camera in the woods outside the house. This is the actual videotape recorded that night, which revealed a mysterious array of lights. It was not like any, any type of lightning ball or crawl ball or crawl discharge that I've seen. The radio tower will discharge a, a ball of energy and it will shoot along a line. Uh, this energy did not follow any path. It, it, it almost looked as if it had a, had a mind of its own. The investigator used a spectrometer to check the strength of electromagnetic and radio waves at the house to make sure they had not caused the lights. That could be caused by colliding microwave energy and radio energy just by the sheer location of the property and how the radio signals intersect each other. Uh, we found nothing there, nothing out of the ordinary. The investigator then used a compass to look for magnetic disturbances. In the far corner of the house, Gibbons found that the compass sometimes swirled uncontrollably, unable to settle on a position. Gibbons had worked with energy of all kinds. This kind had him mystified. He finally accepted the idea that Steve Lee's house was haunted. The amount of seemingly random energy and the number of faces in the mirror made him wonder if the log cabin might be sitting atop a spiritual passageway from this world to the next, a so-called portal of famous Hopi Indian legends. The Native American Indians have prophecies of rainbow winds, which is a uh, which is a dimensional portal that they they can travel through. Portals and things like these have a significance as pathways and conduits that spirits travel through. Steve Lee still refused to believe that his home could be haunted, but the portal legend intrigued him. He contacted Dennis Houck, an investigator of haunted houses who knew about portals. Hopi Indians and and people who believe that uh, in the Black Forest area, which goes back quite a long way, that there is traditionally uh, some type of portal that was open to the other side and, and literally hundreds of spirits have gone through. Lee invited Hauk to examine his home. The investigator arrived with an infrared camera capable of revealing energy on film. It shows gradients of invisible energy as different colors. Hauk took infrared pictures around the house and collected what he considered possible proof of a ghostly presence. We get all these types of energies when we take pictures on the Lee property. Then if we look at them, uh, enlarge them without enhancing them in any way, just enlarge them, there's pictures, uh, faces, really uh, truly identifiable pictures of faces. These really are faces uh, of uh, entities or, or some type of energy forming. They're within these ele uh, electromagnetic or infrared phenomena that we're picking up. The strange energy depicted on the infrared film surprised even Hauk. Steve Lee still had no earthly explanation for the strange apparitions. The Lees still live in their cabin in the mountains, and they claim that their photographs still show the mystifying lights and the eerie faces. Traces of spirits traveling in and out of this world to the next. Is the Lee house filled with spirits moving through a legendary portal? Are the surprising photographs evidence of a new kind of energy that allows ghosts this passage? Scientists and skeptics offer a resounding no. Tom Flynn, a photo expert, believes many of the anomalies on the photos have logical explanations. I've examined the Lee pictures and uh, I find far more evidence of common camera problems than of the supernatural. I think that most of these mysterious fogs are various items, including the camera's own strap, that stray very close to the camera, so close that they go out of focus, Picture so close that they're blasted bright white by the on-camera flash. It also creates it. a lot of lens flare. 
and that's where you get the characteristic little round transparent circles that kind of glow whitish. Those who believe that this Colorado house may be sitting on top of a spiritual gateway say that Lee's photos may have captured the portal in action. I believe photographs can catch things. I've seen photographs that have cut other dimensions before at other places and be it through a mirror or through some type of very, very fast speed film, we see ghosts or have ghost apparitions in certain areas because the energies there allow that materialization to happen. Physicist Leon Letterman argues that if believers say there is an energy portal at the Lee House, then they must base their claims on accurate principles of science, not ghostly photographs. There are many, many unknowns in science, but there's a difference between a scientific unknown and a claim that there are sacred spots or haunted houses uh, which can't be authenticated by science. They're just natural phenomena that uh, are misinterpreted by people who desperately want to believe that and have no idea of how science works. Neuroscientist Dr. Michael Persinger does know how science works. He says that geophysics can explain the mysterious lights on Steve Lee's property. When you have geophysical forces focused, even small ones, little teeny ones from the point of view of geophysics, but when you focus them into a small space for a brief time, you can get tremendous magnetic fields generated. If that takes place, you can get fluorescent and light thresholds generated, very much like a will-o'-wisp or electrostatic discharges. And if it's above the luminogenic threshold, you can photograph, like any other kind of electrostatic phenomenon. Persinger says that these strange anomalies in the Earth's natural electromagnetic field are found in many supposedly haunted sites. And sometimes they intersect with the brain waves of people who live there, producing haunt-like feelings. It's a theory he has tested in his Sudbury, Ontario laboratory. Many of the kinds of patterns of fields that are generated in haunted areas that we have found are very complicated. Brief transient fields, erratic shape. If these forces stimulate the brain, you could have feelings of a presence, the sounds of footsteps or movements or, or voices. And of course, that ever ever-present presence, that there's some something looking at you. All of these symptoms mirror events described by the Browns at the height of their supposed haunting. This might also explain why Beth Batesel is not able to escape the ghosts that have haunted her for more than 20 years. Certain highly creative people are more sensitive to these mysterious geophysical forces than others. A fact that for many believers justifies their claims of ghostly encounters. Even though people are sensitive, it does not mean that they're crazy. It surprises me the number of people that have come out of the woodwork to tell me about a light that they've seen in a dark room uh, or a deceased uh, relative that has come back to visit them. And so that this is a much more common uh, f phenomenon than, than we think, but uh, people are hesitant to talk about it because of the implication of some kind of psychopathology. Some skeptics think that belief in ghosts persists even in the face of scientific skepticism because it stands as such a deeply held cultural belief. In a sense, ghosts are in people's heads, but in another sense, culturally and socially, they do exist for them, and indeed for many other people in that society. They are human constructs, so is music, so is poetry. I mean, we, we have to accept these things, these ghosts, all to be respected as creations of the human mind. Believers object to the idea that ghostly encounters are creations of the human mind. Rather, they insist that hauntings deserve respect, because the restless spirits are real. When you come face to face with it, then you have to deal with it as reality, because when you're face to face with something, it is reality. From restless spirits to ghostly gateways, hauntings have the power to instill terror and fear in those who believe in them. Is the ghostly presence actually the work of our own creative minds? Or is it the labor of troubled spirits cursed to roam the earth? For those who have experienced a haunting presence, 
they know they are living on the threshold to the unexplained.